Welcome to this module on how the PEP1T model can be used to model climate change impacts on the agricultural sector. The aim of this module is to offer an overview of most of these following aspects. 1. Why modeling climate change impacts on the agricultural sector with the PEP1T model is relevant. 2. How modeling long-term climate change and shorter-term climate variability impacts on the agricultural sector with the PEP1T model. And three, can we consider adaptation options to climate change with the PEP1T model? By successfully engaging with this module, we hope you will be able to formulate a research question related to climate change impacts on the agricultural sector and also to understand how to incorporate such topics in the standard PEP1T model. Before using the PEP1T model, to model the climate change impacts on the agricultural sector, some preliminary questions have to be answered. What is climate change? Climate refers to the normal weather pattern, for instance rainfall or temperature, in a particular place over several decades. Climate is said to be stable if this weather pattern does not change significantly over time. Climate is said to be changing if statistically significant differences with the normal weather pattern are observed over a long period. In this perspective, a changing climate is often characterized by two components in climactic literature. One, changes in mean weather pattern or climate change in a strict sense detected with long-term records. For instance, global warming is one main characteristic of climate change. Two, changes in variance of climate elements or climate variability which describe the way they depart from their average value in given months, seasons, years, or decades, therefore producing warm, cool, wet, or dry periods. It also involves changes in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events such as droughts or floods. These two components of a changing climate are linked. For instance, it is widely projected that with a warming climate, climate variability will also increase. However, climate change and climate variability operate on different time scales. Climate change is a long-term trend. An example is an increased mean of temperature. Climate variability refers to shorter run variations. An example is interannual variations around the long-term trend line. Why is focusing on climate change impacts on the agricultural sector relevant? Agriculture plays a central role in economic and social development of less developed countries. One, it accounts for a large share of the gross domestic product and labor force. Two, it provides income to a majority of the population, therefore contributing to poverty alleviation. Three, it supplies the bulk of basic food for subsistence needs to the population, therefore contributing to food security. 4. It has strong forward and backward linkages with other sectors of the economy. 5. It often represents a major source of foreign exchange earnings. However, this agricultural sector often faces many difficulties such as low productivity, low skill capacity of workers, and a poor level of rural infrastructure. Therefore, it is highly vulnerable to any major stress. Among the potentially major stressors that it faces, climate change and or variability are two of them with possibly huge consequences on economic performance and the welfare of households. What is the place of economic studies in climate change analysis? A growing number of studies coming from different scientific disciplines address climate change issues. One is climate science, which provides scenarios for the future. For instance, the general circulation models used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change simulate the effects of some variables, such as greenhouse gases, that might affect the climate system in a range of scenarios. These scenarios and forecasts are available in the IPCC assessment reports where 20 general circulation models are now recognized. Another is agricultural science that uses these future climate scenarios for providing biophysical scenarios. For instance, the stream hydrological model aims to simulate the water availability. DSSAT, or 
SARA H models numerically simulate the response of crops to changing environmental factors. And another is economic analyses that assess the potential impacts of the future biophysical scenarios on the agricultural sector. These economic studies use either empirical or simulation models. Among the latter, CGE models play a significant role. Why is it interesting to use the PEP1T model for conducting economic analysis of climate change impacts on agriculture? In economic literature, economic studies use various methodologies to attempt to assess the vulnerability of agriculture to climate change. Some analyses use Ricardian or empirical approaches, which are based on the statistical relationships between climate variables and selected agricultural indicators. Other analyses use partial equilibrium approaches, which account for maximizing behaviors of agents, but in a restricted framework. In this context, one benefit of using the PEP1T model relies on its economy-wide general equilibrium framework. This framework allows us to model explicitly the agricultural sector. However, it does not restrict the effects of shocks to agriculture alone, but also captures their consequences in the overall economy through the different linkages among prices, income, supply and demand. Another benefit of using the PEP1T model is its dynamic specification, which allows us to generate time paths of the effects of successive climate change related shocks on economic variables over a given period. A growing number of data sets now provide information about current and future impacts of climate change on the agricultural sector. We provide here some examples that can help to design relevant scenarios for your economic analysis. The choice of a specific database depends on the purposes of each study. Long-run changes in mean climate and shorter-run changes in climate variability do not affect the agricultural sector in the same way. Accordingly, we chose to distinguish these two elements in this module. As a starting point, we will focus on the long-run impacts of climate change. This assessment can be conducted with a deterministic approach by using the results of agronomic studies, which predict the consequences of mean climate change with sufficient confidence. There is a wide range of long-run climate change-related impacts on the agricultural sector that can be analyzed with the PEP1T model. In this capsule, we first chose to focus on the impacts on crop yields. This effects of climate change is described in many studies in agronomic literature. For a majority of crops, yields are expected to be negatively affected by climate change. However, as shown in the figure, it will depend on the type of crops and the type of future climate scenarios that are considered. In the most unfavorable cases, like for instance for soybeans, yields are expected to decrease by 50% until 2100. An easy option for modeling long-run crop yield changes is to consider that the technical shift parameter in the production function of agricultural activities becomes a time-dependent new variable of the model. This parameter can be found in equation 3 of the standard PEP1T model and it determines the total factor productivity of each activity. An additional equation should thus be included in the PEP1T model for agricultural activities. The red term is the exogenous depreciation rate of the total factor productivity parameter based on long-run change hypotheses. This depreciation is thought to be continuous and is expressed in average annual growth rate. Within this framework, the total factor productivity of agricultural activities can be slowly modified over the period of simulation depending on climate change expected effects. At this stage, one main challenge is to define relevant scenarios for these future yield changes. These projections can be taken from agronomic studies from biophysical models, for instance DSSAT or SARA H for Africa, or empirical models. The latter establish statistical links between agronomic and climate observations from the past to forecast future yields in new climatic conditions. Once these future evolutions of yields are defined, we can feed the PEP1T model with these exogenous shocks on the agricultural productivity 
either negative or positive, depending on crops. The expected effects will be numerous with the PEP1T model. For instance, on agricultural product markets, they will increase the marginal costs of crops and thus will lead to price increases and lower demand. However, many other effects can be expected on the other markets in the general equilibrium framework of PEP1T. The same methodology can be used for livestock activities. These form part of a variety of farming systems and are also impacted by climate change, mainly through increasing temperatures and precipitation variations and increased animal diseases. In this case, the analysis can be challenging because the impacts of a changing climate on livestock are often harder to predict than the impacts for crops. Moreover, as extensive livestock production is often associated with semi-arid areas not good for growing crops, climate change might create conditions for shifting from crops to livestock that should also be included in the analysis. The second long-run climate change impact that we chose to focus on is water availability. Freshwater resources are indeed crucial for irrigated agricultural activities. However, precipitation and potential evaporation are the main climactic drivers controlling these resources, which, as shown in the map, are projected to reduce significantly in most subtropical regions with the consequences of climate change. These reductions of water availability might then intensify competition for water among irrigated agricultural sectors and or among agriculture and other economic sectors, therefore increasing the risk of a water crisis. The main objective here is to simulate changes in water availability for irrigated agricultural activities over a given long-run period. At this stage, two options can be considered. A first basic approach consists of considering water resources as an implicit factor of production for irrigated agriculture, which determines the total factor productivity of these activities. Within this framework, water is a hidden factor which is not explicitly modeled. Rather, it is embedded inside the value of agricultural capital already included in the equation 3 of the standard PEP1T model. Within this framework, the simulation scenarios will consider changes in water availability through exogenous changes in productivity. At this stage, we can use the same method as used for yields. One first challenge is to estimate the link between the water availability and the productivity of irrigated activities. A second challenge is to define relevant scenarios for future water availability. All these data must be taken from agronomic studies. The second option is more sophisticated. It consists in explicitly considering water resources as a factor of production, which must be included in the production function of irrigated agricultural activities, equation 3 of the standard PEP1T model. At this stage, any nested structure can be considered. Water can be included like the other factors or combined with land as a composite factor. For designing scenarios for simulations, it can be assumed there are fixed water endowments for a given period T. These endowments are changed over a given simulation period by using future projections of available surface and groundwater. Such forecasts can be taken from hydrological studies, for example the stream model, and passed on to the PEP1T model through exogenous decreases of water endowments at every period. However, including water in the PEP1T model as an explicit factor of production is not always straightforward. A first challenge is to find information on water usage for agriculture. This data is not provided by standard national accounts data. In that case, it can be necessary to use other data sources such as the United Nations System of Environmental Economic Accounts, which are not always available for every country. For some additional elements on such water topics, you can refer to the useful model extending PEP1T with environmental features. A second challenge is that water, because it is a non-market good coming from rain or direct groundwater extraction, does not allow gauging the water usage from market transactions, and it can be difficult to convert physical quantities of water to monetary values. Moreover, parameters determining the marginal productivity of water 
in constant elasticity substitution production functions cannot be estimated through calibrations. It is not possible to couple a factor of production having a virtual zero price with production functions where marginal productivity never goes to zero. In that case, the marginal productivity of water must be deduced from agronomic studies or from food and agricultural organization data. A last challenge is to value the degree of substitutability between water and other factors in agricultural production functions. It is a crucial element for the analysis and the results of the simulation. It thus should be addressed carefully. In the second part of this module, we will focus on the shorter run impacts of a changing variability of the future climate. By its very nature, this topic includes uncertainty features and thus necessitates using a stochastic approach. Why is accounting for a changing future climate variability important? Climate variability is a natural part of climate. As we have already said, it describes the way climate elements, such as temperature or rainfall, depart from their average value producing warm or cool periods or wet or dry periods. This climate variability affects agriculture performance and the overall economy. As an illustration, the figure presented here indicates that there seems to be a direct link between the interannual rainfall variability and economic growth in Zimbabwe. A growing consensus in climactic literature suggests that climate variability may increase in the future. This greater variability might have strong adverse consequences. For instance, it might induce shifts in the onset and length of growing seasons with a higher probability of crop failure. It might also cause increases of the prevalence of crop failures or livestock diseases, etc. Such changes might have adverse effects on agriculture over and above the impacts due to mean climate change. In this context, focusing on mean climate alone probably seriously underestimates the potential impacts of a changing climate, and an increasing variability should be considered. To assess the impact of a greater variability in the climate, we chose to focus on agricultural yields again. As already done in the previous section for the mean changes in yields, it is possible to consider that predicted shocks on yields feed the PEP1T model through exogenous shocks on the technical shift parameter and agricultural production functions. However, compared with the previous deterministic approach, the red term is now a stochastic parameter. It can be defined as the exogenous annual change rate from a normal value of the total factor productivity produced by climate variability. It is a time-dependent variable, either being positive for a good year or negative for a bad year. At this stage, the main challenge is to define relative stochastic scenarios for this exogenous annual change rate in order to account both for a normal variability and for a climate change-related higher variability. As a first step, normal yield variability can be deduced from their past observed variability by assuming that these historical data do not already contain variations in weather conditions linked to climate change. Available time series can be easily found in FAO datasets. This normal variability must be reproduced for the future over a period of simulation. Several approaches can be used for this replication. In the first very basic approach, the observed historical weather sequence can be duplicated identically over the period of simulation in a single future sequence. In a second approach, stochastic sequences of future weather can be drawn from the historical climate distribution by using basic Monte Carlo simulations, assuming that observed historical data are likely to reoccur. Such an approach generates a large number of future sequences. And lastly, a more sophisticated approach consists of using time series econometric models, for instance VAR models, and forecasting procedures, for instance bootstrap procedure, in order to provide a very large number of future sequences that are representative of the past variability. At this stage, whichever approach is used, all projected future sequences preserving past variability have to be simulated with the PEP1T model, and the results of these simulations must be compared to the BAU scenario. 
Year by year, mean results observed among all sequences show the average effect of a normal yield variability. Accordingly, these results can be used for defining a normal variability scenario that will be further considered as a baseline scenario for assessing the effects of a future changing variability. Then, relevant simulation scenarios for a changing future variability must be defined. The critical question is exactly how and how much the historical distribution should be modified in order to account for changes in climate variability. This evaluation is challenging. Even though the hypothesis of a future greater variability is well accepted, climate or agronomic models are not really able to forecast it adequately. Therefore, there is often no other choice but to develop our own subjective distributions for future yields. Different options can then be considered at this stage. The first option consists of increasing the variance of the distribution of yields without changing its shape. With this approach, the mean value of future yields is preserved, but the variance is increased. In other words, the deviations are the same on average, but there will be more positive and negative and record positive and negative values in the future. The second option consists of changing the shape of the distribution of yields by considering a thicker tail for this distribution and thus an increased weight of future negative shocks. In that case, the probability distribution preserves its mean. However, the variability evolves through a change in asymmetry towards the negative part of the distribution. With this option, it will be observed to have constant positive and record positive values, but increases in negative and record negative values. In a last option, it can be interesting to combine the long-run deterministic effects and the shorter-run stochastic effects of a future changing climate for a full assessment analysis of its effects on yields. It can be done by imposing both changes in mean and variance in future yield series as shown in the figures presented here, either for symmetric or asymmetric changes for variability. In the second example, we chose to focus on the specific case of extreme weather events. The occurrence of such events, for example, extreme heat, severe droughts and floods, heavy rainfall, intense storms, etc., is directly associated with climate variability. With an increasing climate variability, it can thus be expected that there would be changes in the frequency and severity of these extreme events. Focusing on these specific cases can be interesting as, when they occur, they have disastrous effects on the agricultural sector, particularly if critical thresholds in temperature and or rainfall are reached. In economic literature, extreme events are often looked at with a risk assessment perspective where disaster risk is a combination of three components. Hazard refers to a potentially destructive extreme event with a low but significant probability of occurrence. Exposure refers to the inventory of elements in an area that could be affected by a hazard event. Vulnerability refers to the propensity of exposed elements to suffer adverse effects when impacted by hazard events. Finally, the disaster effects of an extreme event refer to its ultimate socio-economic consequences. These consequences depend strongly on the levels of vulnerability and exposure of the country, which are generally the outcome of its development process. They include direct losses of damages, and indirect losses which are not provoked by the event itself, but by its follow-up consequences within the overall economic system. In literature, these indirect losses are often evaluated using CGE models. For assessing extreme events effects with the PEP1T model, one first step is to model their specific impacts on agriculture. These specific shocks define the intensity of an event when it occurs. There is a wide range of effects that can be considered. For yields, it can be assumed that agricultural productivity is strongly reduced in a year where there is an extreme event occurrence, T asterisk. It returns to its normal value in the subsequent year. We can also suppose that lands are heavily deteriorated in an event affected area for the year of an occurrence, T asterisk, for instance, during a major flood or a major drought. 
As reflected in the equations presented here, it is possible to see a higher than normal annual depreciation rate, which slowly recovers over subsequent years, in this case two years. The same effects can be assumed for livestock's capital because of reduced pasture, increased diseases, or animal losses. The second step for assessing the effects of extreme events using the PEP1T model is to design relevant scenarios for the event's occurrences. However, as already stressed for climate variability, climate models are not able to simulate the future occurrence of extreme events adequately. In this context, their future frequency over the period of simulation should be defined with the same methodology as for climate variability scenarios. This is done by projecting future sequences, including past normal occurrences of extreme events, and by increasing symmetrically or asymmetrically the variance of their distribution. However, if the analysis only aims to focus on extreme events, a more pragmatic approach can also be considered. For instance, the occurrence of one event in one year can be assumed to be independent of climate in other years, and it can be modeled with a binomial distribution with different probabilities according to expected changes in the future. The last issue that we chose to focus on in this capsule is about adaptation options to climate change. A small developing country cannot modify its future climate and its exposure to climate change related effects. However, some coping strategies could help it to minimize its vulnerability over time to both climate change and variability. In economic literature, it is common to distinguish between two types of coping strategies. Those that are used by farmers themselves as an autonomous adaptation to changing conditions and which are a natural part of their behavior and those that are implemented by governments for reducing the effects of climate change. The main motivation here is to compare the results of climate change scenarios with and without adaptation strategies. Some endogenous adaptation already exists a minima in the PEP1T model. An example is accumulation dynamics based on land rental rate, intersectoral migrations of labor, changes in prices and patterns of consumption, etc. However, the reality is more flexible and farmers can employ a wider range of autonomous strategies for enhancing the resilience to climate change and variability. In recent literature, these strategies form part of the so-called climate smart agriculture. There is a wide range of options such as adjusting crop patterns or agricultural calendars, changing land uses, using improved varieties adapted to new climatic conditions, using alternative technologies of production to restore degraded drylands and increase soil fertility, and so on. Changes in land uses by farmers is an example of an autonomous strategy that can be easily considered with the PEP1T model. For this strategy, total land must be split into a number of different categories. Many criteria can be used for this disaggregation, such as agroecological zones, the nature of crops, the possibility of irrigation, etc. Each agricultural activity is then supposed to use one of these classes of land as a factor of production, just like labor and capital. In the social accounting matrix, the amount of each class of land used by a given agricultural activity is represented by its payments as a factor of production, or land rentals. These rentals represent land productivity and thus must be distinguished from those of capital in the national accounts. The allocation of lands between these different agricultural uses can be specified through a constant elasticity transformation function as shown in the equation presented here. Given the specific purpose of each study, this equation can be reproduced and nested as many times as needed depending on the types of crops, the different land uses, etc. Within this framework, the PEP1T model now accounts for land heterogeneity and for competition for lands. Landowners are supposed to maximize the total value of land rents. The parameters used in the constant elasticity transformation structure determine the degree of substitutability between land classes 
and govern the responsiveness of land supply to changes in relative yields and or prices. They are usually derived from literature, but can also be estimated if data are available. In simulations of climate change impacts, the opportunity costs of alternative land uses after a shock can be considered at this point. This approach is often used in CGE studies by accounting for alternative land uses and autonomous adaptations from farmers. However, some drawbacks should be stressed at this point. First, the CET function transforms land on a value basis rather than on a physical basis. Second, land conversion costs are not explicitly modeled. Third, it is hard to estimate the empirical parameters of the CET function for global long-term simulations. And four, CET functions are symmetrical to all changes. For example, the ease of conversion from agricultural land to forest land is the same as from forest land to agricultural land. Finally, the hypothesis of a fixed total land for all agricultural sectors limits the supply response of the economy to any shock. In this context, some improvements are sometimes considered in land-focused CGE studies. One improvement is to use specific functions for allocating land that preserves the volume additivity of lands on a physical basis. For example, the additive form of the CET function or the logit function. Another improvement is to introduce the possibility of expanding economic activities into natural land which were not used as agricultural land. For instance, it can be interesting to introduce a land supply curve that determines how much land area can expand for a change in total land value, depending on the marginal productivity of the remaining available land. However, a critical issue in modeling such supply of land is the information about the availability of new lands that might be brought into production and on their productivity. Besides autonomous adaptations, it can be interesting to simulate adaptation policies to climate change. With this in mind, any option aimed at sustainably enhancing the agricultural productivity can be considered. A number of options are often identified in the National Adaptation Program of Action submitted by countries to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and in broader programs for agricultural development in each country. In this context, a number of strategies can be simulated using the PEP1T model. In each case, the methodology should include the level of public investments needed for the strategy, the specific effects on agriculture of these investments, and a cost-benefits analysis of the strategy. In this first example, we focus on the extension of irrigation capacities. As we have already stressed, water resources are critical for agricultural activities but are projected to reduce significantly with climate change. In this context, a better access to reliable water sources could remove the farmer's dependence on precipitations, extend the growing season in normal years, and provide a supplemental water supply at critical times. In the PEP1T model, an expansion of irrigated land can be considered over the simulation period. As shown in equations, it could be done at the expense of unirrigated land until the irrigation potential of the country is achieved. For many countries, the Food and Agriculture Organization provides reliable estimates of this irrigation potential. It should be noted at this stage that an increase of the total factor productivity associated with this irrigation expansion can be considered at the same time. In the second example, we focus on improvements in the rural road network as a planned adaptation for coping with climate change. In many developing countries, this rural road infrastructure is still very limited, which explains its inefficiency. In this context, extant literature suggests that greater investments in such core infrastructures could contribute to agricultural productivity growth. Accounting for this effect in the PEP1T model can be relevant when considering the rural road network as a public good with a productivity effect on agricultural activities. Within this framework, the agricultural productivity is now a function of the road network growth rate and of a spillover effect. Unfortunately, there is no consensus on the exact value of this spillover effect in economic literature 
and empirical estimates display variation across studies. Perhaps the best strategy is to estimate it yourself. It is now time to conclude this module and to give you some last advice. One very important thing before starting any impact assessment analysis is to ask yourself some preliminary questions. The first question is, what is the most relevant time period for my analysis? Depending on the purpose of your study, you will have to choose between a long-run analysis of climate change, a shorter-run analysis of climate variability, or a combination of both approaches. The second question is, what are the most relevant climate change impacts for the simulation scenarios? As we have already mentioned, there is a wide range of impacts that can be simulated with the PEP1T model, and it is often tempting for developers to consider many different aspects. However, given the complexity of the effects that are simulated in a general equilibrium framework, it is often necessary to carefully define the specific research question that you want to address and to accept that you will not be able to include all aspects of climate change. The third question that you have to answer before starting your analysis is, what is the most relevant disaggregation for the agricultural sector? There is indeed a lot of possible criteria that you could choose depending on crops, type of agriculture, geographical areas or type of farming, and so on. Again, the most relevant disaggregation depends on the specific research question that you want to address. Fourth, before developing any analysis, the question of the availability of data is also determinant. Without reliable data, you will not be able to conduct any relevant analysis. Finally, as the PEP1T model's results are only relevant at representative agent level, it could be useful to ask yourself if it is necessary to develop a microsimulation module. Depending on your research question, providing results in terms of a household's welfare indicators like poverty or food security could indeed provide a deeper understanding of the potential effects of climate change on the agricultural sector. Another important aspect before starting any impact assessment analysis is to be ready to deal with uncertainty. There is indeed a lot of sources of uncertainties at different stages of the analysis. The first source is about the future of the climate itself. Even though the IPCC stresses the improvement in the ability of climate models to forecast climate, these predictions must be used with care. Producing reliable future scenarios remains challenging given the complexity of climate dynamics and the numerous uncertain drivers of future climate. This uncertainty is even higher for climate variability projections or for low-scale forecasts at the regional or national levels. The second source of uncertainty is with the projections of future biophysical impacts on the agriculture. For instance, future agricultural yields are expected to be affected by climate change. But here again, these forecasts are uncertain because in the long run, they depend on complex dynamics involving environmental factors, which produce sometimes contradictory effects. For instance, CO2 concentration, temperature, and precipitation. They also depend on many socioeconomic factors concerning changes in farming practices that are not already known. The same caution should be applied for the projections of future water availability, which are also uncertain as it implies complex hydrological modeling. Finally, the last source of uncertainty is about the future evolution of the economy. The economy's long-term trajectory is unknown, including its adaptation policies. Given these high levels of complexity and uncertainty, our last advice is that you should never forget that conducting simulations with the PEP1T is not a forecasting exercise. When interpreting your results, you should remember that your simulations are only ex ante counterfactual experiments which seek to answer a complex perspective, what if question. What would be the economic consequences if the impacts of climate change on agriculture were 